Ballard to Apple documented the failures of strategic planning in higher education. In Revolution, Rich DeMillo describes those consequences and tells the stories of revolutionaries who are changing institutional futures. So I, I did this experiment for, for, for Abelard to Apple, uh, and, and I, I repeated portions of it for, for Revolution. Uh, and, and the experiment was, was really to see whether or not anyone could tell one strategic plan from another. Uh, and, you know, w without, without, um, um, without a sense that, that, that I have this reasoned argument for how I'm going to succeed, it becomes very easy to, 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 to mimic the form of strategic planning without actually engaging in any of the necessary elements of strategic planning. Uh, and you can understand why. Um, for most of our, our existence, uh, there have been no competitive threats to universities. And so the form of strategic planning was entirely ceremonial. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't address the challenges that an institution um, was going to see coming down the road. It didn't, uh, it didn't uh, address the relative imbalances uh, of the various stakeholders in, in the institution. Uh, and, and so you really didn't need a strategic one. We were just going to continue doing what we, um, what, we, what we did. Well, that's not the case today. That, I mean, the, the case today is, is that it's hard to write down on a single sheet of paper all of the challenges that, that an institution, and I'll take any institution uh, in this category, um, that, that what challenges they're going to face over the next five years, ten years, um, generation. At that point, without saying how you're going to address those challenges becomes very difficult to chart a course for, for survival. Now, you know, there, there are institutions that will be able to ride through all of those challenges simply because they've amassed such wealth, such brand value, that, that, that they will define a set of rules, even if the set of rules that they're currently operating under today are not going to be useful 10 years from now. They will define their own rules, and, and they'll be just fine. Is it fair to say those are the elites? Those are the elites. That's right. That's right. And you know, I, I people ask me what what my definition of elite is, and you know, you can look at endowments and and, and make a pretty pretty good guess. You can you can look at at world rankings of universities and find the same universities at the top of the list in every every ranking. Whether or not you believe the rankings measure quality, those are the places that are setting the rules for the rest of the industry. But it's paper thin. It's it's a it's such a tiny fragment. Uh, of what higher education is, that it's not a useful guide in figuring out what the rest of the world should be doing. Our conversation then turned to three revolutionary examples of making college more accessible. First, the work of Paul LeBlanc at Southern New Hampshire. And they were fortunate enough to, to have um, two presidents, um, one who was able to come in and solve their financial problems just simply by whittling back missions and, 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 and getting rid of getting rid of programs that didn't make any right sense. Right sizing. Right, 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 right sizing. Kind of getting, getting through the crisis stage. Um, the person who followed, uh, the person named Paul LeBlanc, um, who, who came, came from, um, um, from the, the, um, the e-publishing uh, world, came from, from, um, from the startup mentality, uh, had had a strong commitment to the liberal arts, but also had a strong sense of social mission um, that that said that that the kinds of institutions that were setting the rules for most American college students were not the kinds of institutions that those students were going to. Uh, they were they were the elite uh, the elite institutions, and what mattered for the students that that would be um, uh, uh, in his sweet spot um, were concerns that you would have not as a high school graduate but as a 35 year old person that was trying trying to, to work your way up in a, uh, in a, in a company uh, that, that really didn't have four years to spend you know, in a residential campus uh, campus experience uh, and, and that started Southern New Hampshire's journey towards looking at online distribution of courses to looking at competency based uh, education and just reorienting itself towards a financial model in which employers and universities 
go hand in hand to provide a level of education mm -hmm. that was meaningful for a lot of for a, a lot of a lot of people. Uh, it turned that institution around. Paul won't say this, but but it's my belief uh, that 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 change in direction saved Southern New Hampshire from um, almost certain um, certain ruin. Jackson State University, one of the nation's historically black colleges and universities, has focused on expanding enrollments and innovations in teaching first-year students. And, and Jackson State was one of those um, uh, HBCUs that was on a downward path. Um, the, the kinds of students that, that, that they wanted to recruit um, was a shrinking population. Uh, because they had been largely unsuccessful at completing, uh, at competing with local state universities. So Jackson State is in, in the middle of, of Mississippi. Uh, just down the road is Mississippi State. Just up the road is Oxford, Mississippi, uh, and, and the University of, of Mississippi, which had been really, really good at taking bread and butter students from an HBCU and offering them a large, glamorous, big college experience. Uh, regardless of the fact that, that they probably didn't get the kind of education that would have mattered for most of them, which was an education that would allow them to go back to their, their communities and make their communities better. And so um, there was a change of presidency at Jackson State. The new president came in and said, you know what, our problem is that we're shrinking our aspirations. We're using our mission as an HBCU as a straitjacket. What we really need to do is to use it as a platform. Uh, so what can we do uh, that is better than what the experience would be at, at Ole Miss, let's say, for the typical Jackson State student? And, and one of the things that they, that they noticed immediately was, was that at, uh, at Ole Miss, um, uh, talented African-American freshmen uh, are in, in classes with a variety of, of, of students, a variety of different, uh, different levels of achievement, a variety of different uh, different um, uh, aptitudes for, for college. Not, not a shrinking uh, profile, but an expansive profile. So they realized immediately that, that they had to find a way to make uh, a bell-shaped curve out of their, out of their freshman class. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what they did was, was, was really kind of radically simple. Um, they made it an element of, of Dean's compensation uh, to curate a freshman class, uh, and and they weren't talking about about you know importing white students or importing uh, uh, Asian students to make it to make it a more representative sample. They were talking about going out and finding those black students from the community that had the skills to succeed at a place like Jackson State and bringing them in and giving them an educational experience that they wouldn't get at another institution. Um, and, and that was the second piece of the puzzle for Jackson State. The second piece of the puzzle was to, was to not start with, with freshman classes that were lectures uh, conducted to faceless masses of, of students, which is what faculty members really like to, to think about. Um, it, it involved uh, recognizing that the, the critical hurdles that those students would have to get over had more to do with acquiring critical reading skills, critical writing skills, uh, uh, adding to a standard curriculum things that were meaningful uh, to, 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 their, to their, their communities. Um, and for them, what it meant was giving the students the tools to create their own primary uh, uh, learning materials. So, so essentially, putting in the hands of the students the ability in their first sociology course to think like a sociologist, which everyone knows is one of the primary characteristics uh, that you have to get across to students in order to get them to think expertly about a, a field. Um, and, and, and actually producing, in addition to what a standard textbook in sociology would provide, uh, the sociology of what they call new peoples. So, so the sociology that, that kind of wraps around their, uh, their community, which you can't get from, from uh, a bookshelf type textbook in this area. You have to go out and do the research in order, in order to do that. Uh, in, in Revolution, I, I, make, I make Arizona State and Michael Crow in particular much more central, central characters for, for a few reasons. Uh, one is I think that, that Arizona State is on a unique experimental track uh, to become a much different kind of public uh, uni university. 
Um, you know, they, they will say, for example, that, that Arizona State operates at such a scale um, that you can find somewhere between three to five Ivy League institutions contained within the student, the student body. And they're quite right. Uh, no matter how you decide to cut it, student aptitude, income level, whatever, whatever you want, there are probably 15,000, 20,000 uh, students within Arizona State uh, that would together make up that kind of, of institution. But of course, there are 100,000 students. So, so, so having, having three Ivy League universities you know, in, this, in this larger enterprise of 100,000 people um, is helpful to know about, um, but it, it doesn't help you very much figure out what you, what you are. And of course, what they are is an institution that serves broadly um, uh, the people of the state of Arizona, which aside from Tucson and Phoenix is largely rural, uh, uh, largely Spanish speaking, largely poor. Uh, and, and they've addressed the question uh, in a very serious way about how you go from, from being a university qualified student who comes from that kind of background to someone who actually succeeds at a place like, like Arizona State. Michael talks about, uh, talks about erasing accidents of circumstance. And I think it's a wonderful phrase. Uh, what does he mean by that? means that students come to you with a set of innate skills, with a set of ambitions. They also come to you with a background that you can do nothing about. Right. Uh, and, and that's a complete accident. That's, that's, not, that's not their fault. It's not, it's not the fault of the, uh, of the schools that, that, they, that they attended. But it, it's a, a, a chasm that has to be bridged. You have to figure out how you move the students from their level of preparation when they enter to being successful graduates. Of the, of the university, and, and, and that's what I see um, in, um, in the Arizona State experiments being addressed in, in, in full flower. And a, a lot of it has to do with training people at, at public universities to take that, that mission on entirely. Uh, some of it is, is incorporating in your mission as an institution responsibility for the social well-being of the people that you, um, that you serve. Some of it is, is successful use of technology. You know, Michael. Michael uh, is is um, uh, is really um, uh, excited by by this idea. You know, I, I, in my interviews with John Hennessy, um, president of Stanford, uh, I, I asked him I asked him who who he thought was was making inroads in this area, uh, and and he was very quick to point to Michael Crow, and 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 uh, and, and say that the thing that we can learn from Arizona State is that you can't run away from your social mission. You can't run away from the people that you're supposed to serve. Uh, and, and it's possible to find examples, uh, examples like that. I wish there were more of them, but the fact of the matter is there's not. Uh, and and you know, what I said in, in Abelard uh, about the sheer number of institutions that are putting themselves at risk, I think has been borne out by the, by the facts. Um, you know, what, what, whether that's 50% or 2 thirds uh, of, of, of the institutions um, you're going to see uh, a great shaking out uh, in higher education, which institutions simply cease to exist, or, or cease to exist in their current form. In part three, Rich DeMello recounts the nation's history of nurturing colleges and universities, today's fraying commitments, and the urgent need for a renewed social contract in support of higher education. Mm -hmm.